Hi, hello, and welcome to The Word. We continue with the letters from Paul. We are walking through the letter to the Corinthians. Things got a bit serious in there the last time with a man having sex with his stepmother and Paul reminding them of how holy their body is because they are part of the body of Christ. So we are warned about sexual sin. That sin is a sin which is the only one that we use our bodies to commit. But there is lots more to be said concerning believers, unbelievers, and marriage. So let's dive right in. Ready to study? Let's get started. As I told you before, most of the letters, if not all, that Paul had written were always based on questions he was asked, or counsel that was needed, or encouragement to be given. You must first understand this context to appreciate the responses. This helps, or also helps in better understanding of how we take the information given to the congregants. Paul has focused on marriage in this part of his letter. Let's see what he has to say. But before we do, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and worship you for your goodness and your mercy. We pray that you will bless us as we continue to study and learn and grow spiritually. Bless us now, we pray, for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We go straight to 1 Corinthians 7. Now, Regarding the question you ask in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. Now we don't even have to imagine the question that was asked to him to warrant this response. He actually responded with the question, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but you have to be very careful because sexual immorality is out there. So make sure you have your own husband or wife. But what more does he say on the subject? Verse four, the wife gives authority over her body to her husband and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. See the reason? Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Paul is being practical because you are a sexual unit. Both parts of the unit must be in agreement if there must be a cessation of sexual activity. The devil will get to you over your hunger if it was just taken from you like that. But however, some women who claim to be believers just shut down on their husbands, leaving them out to dry. I say this as a concession, not as a command, but I wish everyone who is single just as I am, yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried, just as I am. Again, Paul is a reasonable apostle. He said this is not a command and certainly not from God. He's advising that those who can stay unmarried do so. So whenever you ask if Paul was married, here is your answer. If you think you can manage being single, do so. But if that gift is not given to you, then you know what you have to do. Get married. Verse 9, but if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. But for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband. But if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to him. And the husband must not leave his wife. Now I will speak to the rest of you, though I do not have a direct command from the Lord. If a fellow believer has a wife who is not a believer, and she is willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. 
And if a believing woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy. But now they are holy. But if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other. For God has called you to live in peace. Don't you wives realize that your husbands might be saved because of you? And don't you husbands realize that your wives might be saved because of you? That counsel is solid. Believers should not leave each other. He was dealing with the case of those who believe in Jesus and those who don't. Unbelievers versus believers. Not believers of one denomination versus another denomination. Where both believe in Jesus. So you cannot call a person who is not of your denomination an unbeliever. It's a sacrilegious way to make yourself feel saved in your denomination and others lost if they are not a part of it. Paul gave advice as to which situation they should allow the other to go. If that spouse is not to accept Jesus and the insult it brings, then let them go. But if they are willing to stay, you may never know your influence will help um, that person. Each of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you were when God first called you. This is my rule for all the churches, all the congregations. Verse 18, for instance, a man who was circumcised before he became a believer should not try to reverse it. And the man who was uncircumcised when he became a believer should not be circumcised now. For it makes no difference whether or not a man has been circumcised. The important thing is to keep God's commandments. Yes. Each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave of Christ. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. Oh, he's speaking of other things other than marriage. Well, I guess you cannot go back from circumcision. If you are circumcised, you will remain so. But the point is, whether you do or do not, it will not change your standing with God. Salvation is not about these things. But listen further to what he writes. Verse 25, now regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married, I do not have a command from the Lord for them, but the Lord in his mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted and I will share it with you. Because of the present crisis, I think it is best to remain as you are. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it is not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it is not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles. And I am trying to spare you those problems. But let me say this, dear brothers and sisters, the time that remains is very short. So from now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy or their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. For this world as we know it will soon pass away. Ah, so Paul's counsel was based on his certainty that Jesus would return soon. So his admonition to them was don't try to marry now. Don't try to separate now. Don't Focus on earthly because that is soon to pass away. Now look how many years have passed and Jesus has not yet come. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. 
an unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided in the same way a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. Here we go. Paul was given counsel not directly from the Lord and also directly from the Lord, but trying to help the Corinthians prepare themselves for working for the Lord instead of husband and wife distraction. Now, if you consider this letter to be the word of God, meaning it was directly inspired by God, then Paul would not have to say in certain places that this is just my opinion. This is not a direct command from God or God has given me wisdom to counsel you wisely. So let us take the letter for what it means. A letter to believers of churches. But if a man thinks that he is treating his fiance properly and will inevitably give in to his passions, let him marry her as he wishes. It is not a sin. But if he has decided firmly not to marry and there is no urgency and he can control his passion, he does well not to marry. So the person who remarries, who marries his fiance, does well. And the person who doesn't marry does even better. That's Paul all the way, all the time. God wants us to marry. Paul is saying, if you do, it's good. If you don't, it's even better. It's only the circumstance of the urgency of the second coming and the need for workers uh, that not being married becomes better. So no one can say that Paul was teaching abstinence from marriage or stopping you from being married. They asked him questions and he's answering them. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. But in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single. And I think I am giving you counsel from God's spirit when I say this. My opinion, but counsel from God's spirit. Widows don't bother to get married again. The spirit of God is telling me to tell you this. Now, he says, and I think, are you sure? Did he whisper that in your ear, Paul? So this part of the letter centers around staying married or marrying again if your spouse dies. And the answer is better not to do so because you need to be free to work for the Lord. Now, if they were close to the coming of the Lord back then, what about now? Do I hear someone saying, Pastor, I will pass on the marriage thing? Remember, if you abstain, it should be to give yourself wholly and wholeheartedly to the Lord or else your sexual desires will send you helter skelter and you'll be in trouble. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 8. Now, regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols, yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church, the congregation. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. So here he goes into the next question that was asked him. His response is a good one. We know that you know the answer on that, but anyhow, I will respond. So what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a god and that there is only one god. There may be so-called gods, but both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords but for us there is one god the father by whom all things were created and for whom we live and there is one lord jesus christ through whom all things were created and through whom we live yeah we know that these idols are not real gods and there is only one god so what is the purpose for the question 
But a serious point came out there. There is one God, and that is the Father, by whom all things were created, and one Lord, through whom all things were created. Boy, this thing is huge. Is Paul saying that Jesus Christ is not God, but only the Father is God? And the Father is not the Lord, but only Jesus is? And while everything was created by the Father, they were all created through Jesus? So since God gave Jesus the permission to create, by extension, God the Father has created all things and also Jesus. Again, I sell it just the way it was baked. I'm adding no sugar, no honey, no cinnamon. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Lord. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods, and their weak consciences are violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it, and we don't gain anything if we do. Oh, you know I love these sentiments. It seems like some denominations read only what they want from Scripture. Let me spell it out for you again. It is true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. Do you understand that? That's nonsense about being obedient to God by not eating unclean foods. is utter rubbish. The New Testament writer who speaks to God after Jesus died says, There is nothing like clean and unclean food. That was under the instructions given to Moses. Nothing you eat can make you better or worse. Listen to this. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it. We don't gain anything if we do. Boy, oh boy. People, open your eyes. Sound the warning. Anyone who teaches you about abstaining from food are not teaching you God's way. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live, for I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Paul goes on a personal level. Now knowing all that, we know that an idol is really not a god. There are those who are so weak in their understanding, weak in their understanding, that eating food that came from the temple that was offered to idols will cause them to stumble. In that case, I will not eat any meat if it is going to cause you to stumble. Well, we don't have that issue around us, but in some places that may still apply. Now, there is a difference in what we just concluded and teaching people to abstain from certain foods because they are unclean. Don't get tied up now. 1 Corinthians 9. Am I not as free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you belong to the Lord? Even if others think I am not an apostle, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. This is my answer to those who question my authority. So we now know that there were those who were questioning the legitimacy of Paul and whether he was a true apostle. That would mean that if they don't think he was, then they did not have to listen to anything that he had to say. So Paul helped them to know that he is as free as anyone else and that he has seen the Lord, which makes him an apostle. And that even if no one else believes that he is an apostle, they are proof that he is. Don't we have the right to live in your homes and share your meals? Don't we have the right to bring um, a believing wife with us as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers do and as Peter does? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? Serious response there. 
Now, Paul is not saying stay unmarried like I am in the letter, and in the other breath he is referring to his wife. Here he is referring to the other apostles with wives. They are free to come and go and be supported by the kindness of the brethren. And Paul is not worthy of that because, first of all, he is not an apostle. So the talk would have to be, we know Peter and the others, but this Paul was not with Jesus. And besides what we heard about him persecuting the believers, we don't really believe him to be what he said he is, blah, blah, blah. This is frustrating. He continues, what soldier has to pay his own expenses? What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of its fruit? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? Am I expressing merely a human opinion or does the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Was God thinking only about oxen when he said this? Wasn't he certainly speaking to us? It was written for us so that the one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. Since we have planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to a harvest? or your physical food and drink? If you support others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. We would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. Well, I can hear the pain in that response. Now, Paul went into the book of Moses to make a point. He's saying that when God said you should not muzzle the ox that is treading the grain, he meant the workers for God also. Don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings brought to the temple and those who serve at the altar get a share of the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Now, let us take our time and understand what is said here. He has already used the illustration with the oxen. Now he's talking of the system that they just left, whom the disbelieving Jews have continued. Those who work in the temple, God paid from the temple. In the same way, those who preach the gospel must benefit from it. And that is where the new church comes in. These are two distinct things. It is either we continue temple and sacrifices and get tithes from it, or we preach the gospel and benefit from it. But the benefit here cannot be called tithes and offerings because there is no fixed amount to be given. Verse 15, yet I have never used any of these rights, and I am not writing this to suggest that I want to start now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. Yet, preaching the good news is not something I can boast about, I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. And that is true. To make matters worse, Paul is saying, I prefer to do this without pay. I am not begging for it. I should benefit from it. But I will continue to preach whether you support me or not because God has ordained me to do this. And let me say again, I don't do this because I get money from anyone. I do this because I have dedicated my life to doing this. It is time consuming. It takes lots of energy. It's all, it almost feels unrewarding because there is no, no fanfare to this. But whether you support me financially or not, I will continue to work and do whatever I can to gain finances to let this happen. With this comes a certain measure of freedom. No one can control you when you don't depend on them. Paul continues, What then is my pay? It is the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. That's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. Even though I am a free man with no master. I have become a slave to all people 
to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law. Get that clear. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law. So I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. Hmm. Without understanding what Paul says here, there is a word that can be inserted to describe his behavior. And that would be hypocrisy. Anyone who explains that he is or he or she flips sides based on the group they are with would be called a coward or a hypocrite. While that may be the case in other aspects of circumstances in life, in this one, it is not. Paul clearly understood that the, the old Jewish law had its time, but those who practice it are not aware that Jesus has changed that. So he works with them and their understanding. So certain things he would or would not do in their presence because that is considered sin. But for the man who knows nothing about these laws and do not live by them, he also worked with them. But the key phrase here is this, but I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. Paul would have already explained that um, in Galatians when he wrote them before Corinth. So that understanding is clear. I am saved without the law, but I don't ignore it. So there is a continued distinction between the law of Moses and the law of God, the law in Christ Jesus, the law of Christ Jesus. Everything you do as a believer is centered around pleasing and obeying Christ. The Holy Spirit will direct you as to what is right and wrong, but don't behave as though you are ignorant about basic right and wrong. He already spoke to them about sexual immorality, the main sexual sin that pollutes the body. In Christ, you will walk in righteousness. As simple as that. Verse 22, when I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone. Doing everything I can to serve some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. That is a very difficult thing to do. In other words, he is not judging anyone. But he has an objective. He does not do it for doing sake. He does it for taking you from one place to the next. Verse 24, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Very well. As we said, what he is doing is done for a purpose. He is not shadow boxing. There is order behind what may seem hypocritical. Can you be all things to all men? Do you understand the context? It is done on a spiritual level. Well, if that is what it means, then I will fornicate with my unbelievers so that one day I will bring them into Christ. Um, my drug friends, uh, I will take as much drug with them until I can lead them to Christ. Far from what that means. So we will pause here for now. There is much to gain from the three chapters. So by way of conclusion, we see that Paul continued hammering against sexual sins and that we must continue to keep our bodies pure and holy. If both our mind and body are holy, then should we be afraid to say that we are holy? How can you share in Christ's body and still be unholy at the same time? So it leaves no conclusion but that those who accept Jesus as Savior become holy both mentally and physically. However, his holiness has no sinful nature fighting against him, but ours has. So whenever we make a mistake, he quickly forgives us and does not hold it against us. But when we willfully practice sin, 
there remains no sacrifice. We also saw that Paul was everything to everyone on both sides of the spectrum to help them to a path to Jesus Christ. As we walk our spiritual pathway, may we use this principle where necessary. It is not for you to explain to anyone what you are doing, only to God. Once you are on this spiritual path, continue to work according to what God expects of you. And to everyone, stay away from sexual sin. May the Lord continue to guide and keep you until next time. Let us pray. O Lord, our majestic God, how pure and holy you are. Help us, Lord, to keep our bodies pure and clean. Forgive us if we have polluted our bodies and help us in right thinking. Those of us who rationalize immorality, have mercy on us, Lord. Many claim that their rights are taken away because sexual sin is condemned. Help us who know better to share that knowledge and stand firm by it. As we continue on this earth below, may we allow you to direct us in all that we do. Bless us once again, we pray, for we ask it in no other name but the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks again for watching. If you have been blessed, feel free to like, to share, and subscribe if you have not yet done so. And as you do, may you rest in the wise, objective, resourceful, and definitive word of God. Amen.